Okay, so look, the Labor Party does a good funeral, very famously, and the state memorial service to Gough Whitlam, who died on the 21st of October 2014, um, was not really his funeral, but it was certainly a grand event in a nation that likes to imagine itself as more relaxed than most in its civic rituals. 2,000 people packed the Sydney Town Hall, described as Labor's Cathedral. Of course, it's normally the site, for instance, of New South Wales state uh, conferences, state Labor Party conferences. Uh, a mixture of dignitaries, including Liberal Party Prime Minister Tony Abbott and six former Prime Ministers, and a fortunate few members of the public who'd gained their tickets in a ballot that reputedly attracted over 5,000 applicants. Um, there were 20 Gurindji people from the Northern Territory among the, the mourners. And to the next, um, a reminder, of course, of that great moment when Whitlam um, had ceremonially poured soil into the hands of Gurindji elder Vincent Lingyari, who, of course, declared in reply, we are mates now, um, wherever more gracious words spoken by any Australian. Uh, Paul Kelly and Kev Carmody performed From Little Things, Big Things Grow, a song about the struggles of Lingiari and his people at Whitlam Service. Um, this was a, a brilliantly choreographed affair. Now, you might ask why I'm uh, discussing this, and particularly perhaps today, um, and it's in some ways for fairly selfish motives. I'm, I'm thinking of beginning a book on the political lives of Australians, a history, as I'm calling it um, provisionally, a, a general um, political history of Australia, um, with Gough Whitlam's memorial service. And, and I hope that as I um, talk today, you'll perhaps get a sense of why I think it might be used as a way of, of introducing that topic more broadly. And uh, um, as I explain in the, the written paper, I'm inspired in part by Dominic Sandbrook's um, very interesting book White Heat on, on uh, Britain in the 1960s, where he begins with Winston Churchill's funeral in 1965 as a way of marking the end of, of one era and the beginning of a new one. So mourners um, had begun queuing outside uh, the service three hours before it began. Uh, many more watched it on a screen set up outside the building. There you have it there. Um, the media reported that some booed when Tony Abbott and John Howard appeared on the screen. They cheered their favourite Labor Prime Ministers, Paul Keating, Julia Gillard and Bob Hawke, uh, were more muted in their response to Kevin Rudd. Um, and what would have seemed bizarre a few decades before, politely received Whitlam's nemesis from 1975, Malcolm Fraser. Imagine if you'd sort of been out of the country for 40 years and had come back to that. Um, but Whitlam and Fraser, of course, had long ago made their peace, agreeing to disagree over the events of 1975, as well as, of course, agreeing over so much else um, that uh, um, had come to pass in the years since. I think you know, both saw many of the deficiencies in modern politics, which I'll be talking about here. Um, Whitlam's death had been um, obviously anticipated for some time. He'd been 98 at the time of his death and, and had been unwell. Um, the obituaries and tributes were clearly well and truly ready. Um, the rolling and not so rolling phrases honed, polished and ready to go. Um, he is one of the principal authors of contemporary Australia, uh, intoned the Australian's Paul Kelly, a giant among men who changed Australia forever, said Ross Gittins of the Sydney Morning Herald. And yet Whitlam's death, like his government, was of its time. Um, a Labor Party mainstream, which back in the 1980s, the period I guess with which I'm most familiar, um, could not get far enough away from what it pejoratively called Whitlamism, now wanted to embrace it. Meanwhile, media and public responses spoke to the disillusionment of the present as much as the dreams of the past. This was very much, I think, a ritual that was about the present um, and, and, and not simply uh, you know, kind of history or memory work. Gough Whitlam's passing became the occasion for reflecting on what had gone wrong in Australian politics. And so it's, I guess, anthropologists or cultural historians call this thick description. You take a moment and look at its, its kind of inner workings, its cultural dynamics. What can it tell us about the society that we're examining? And that's really what I'm trying to do uh, at this stage, I think, in a fairly superficial way here, but I hope to, to do a bit more with it. In the most celebrated eulogy of the service, Indigenous leader Noel Pearson, he's 
on the next slide, described this old man, he repeated the phrase often, as the textbook case of reform trumping management. Um, and what did the Romans ever do for us anyway? Pearson asked, taking up, of course, the, the theme made famous in Monty Python's 1970s religious satire, uh, Life of Brian. This Roman, he explained of Whitlam in cadences that for some recalled Martin Luther King, had done a great deal. And Pearson proceeded to list the government's many achievements to the regular applause of those inside the town hall. Kate Blanchett, film star, Oscar winner, spoke in praise, she's next I think on our slides, spoke in praise of free tertiary education. Although there must have been few in the audience who believed that the beautiful and talented woman standing before them had really needed Whitlam's assistance to succeed in life. Pearson, born on a Cape York Lutheran mission, possibly found it easier to make the case for the role of Whitlam in enlarging opportunities for him and for others who'd been for so long on society's margins. He refers, of course, to his own family and community quite often in that eulogy. Everyone seemed to have a story. Everyone could find something that they thought mattered above all else. Bob Carr, the uh, Labor Premier of New South Wales and very much a man of the Labor right, liked that Whitlam had taken on and defeated the left. Paul Kelly, who often celebrates what he calls reform, thought that Whitlam's government had shown that every Prime Minister had to, and I quote, operate as successful reformers. Greg Barnes, a Liberal Party dissident and Tasmanian lawyer, possibly squinting a little too hard, found a classic economic and social liberal in the mould of Paul Keating and John Hewson. I must confess the similarity had never occurred to me before in the latter case, but there, there you have it. Um, what was most telling, though, I think, was the way that many ordinary people who were interviewed by the media, um, especially people outside the town hall looking at the screen or people writing to newspapers, wove the story of the Whitlam government into their own lives. And this is quite interesting, actually. I was involved in a survey uh, earlier this year um, that actually asked people to nominate the 10 most influential historical events in their lifetimes, the things they thought had most shaped Australia. And it's quite clear for the baby boomer generation in particular that the Whitlam government and dismissal are significant. They were up there in, in the top 10, along with things like the moon landing in 1969. So um, this is partly, I think, a, a generational thing. Many declared that it was only Gough who had provided them with the opportunity to attend university. Uh, Maggie Gilchrist, an art critic, recalled that she was writing a master's thesis at the Courtauld in London when Whitlam lost the 1977 election. She wrote to him to thank him for his reform of the universities, which had inspired her to study abroad. Whitlam replied via telegram, it is messages such as yours that have made it all worthwhile. Goff. It's hard not to wonder um, whether many such people are conflating the expansion of the tertiary education system, which of course was going on in the 1960s and 70s, um, with the abolition of fees. But political myth has a power of its own, and it was in full flight in 2014. The Theodora Luftkas, a, a migrant teenager when Whitlam came to power, thought that there was more racism and prejudice in the old Australia before 1972 than afterwards, once Whitlam had ushered in the new one. Penny Mackison lear uh, learned during the, th the free tertiary education that she could not, not otherwise have afforded, um, that Whitlam's reforms meant that single mothers would no longer need to hand over their babies for adoption. If she herself had been born a little later, she reflected, she'd have been spared the anguish of her own forced adoption. For these people, the political was personal and vice versa. Whitlam had changed their lives in the course of changing the nation. This wasn't an abstraction, it was something that was personal and intimate. But amidst the praise for Whitlam, there was implied criticism also for the present crop of politicians. And it's that theme I really want to emphasise for much of the rest of um, the paper. Where Whitlam's star had burned briefly and brightly, theirs, it seemed, burned only briefly, if it burned at all. The service 
was much more than a nostalgic celebration of an extraordinary life, the ages Michael Gordon judged. It was also an invocation to, to, to today's crop of politicians to think big and be brave. Um, the reductive, lowest denominator politics of fear and smear that we are served day after day is a world away from the inspiration and meaningful program Whitlam presented, declared Dennis Atkins of the Brisbane Courier Mail. Goff, declared Paul Kelly, was a perpetual reminder to the contemporary Labor Party of what it has lost. Greg Barnes, who I've already quoted, contrasted Whitlam's grandeur with Bill Shorten, who he said was ambitious only for himself, simply a pragmatic political careerist. The praise of Whitlam and censure for the present political class extended to international affairs. Hugh White, an influential academic, um, praised Whitlam for his role in steering Australia through the massive changes in the global order of the 1960s and 70s. Whitlam's visit to China in 1971, such high-risk politics remained, and I quote, one of the most important events in the history of Australian diplomacy. His style of leadership, White continued, seems far from what we know today, with Whitlam's willingness to explain the nation's changing circumstances, the choices to be faced, the responses likely to work best. White, a former advisor to Bob Hawke, thought there was especially something here for Labor today to consider. Um, Whitlam in opposition, he said, would not have cravenly endorsed the government's la latest ill-considered commitment to Iraq. Maybe he's writing in 2014. Um, as his successors are doing, for no better reason than they do not trust their ability to present a convincing counter-argument. But it was not only the Labor Party whose reduced state attracted the ire of commentators. It was the political system itself. Um, late Ian Marsh, a political scientist, pointed to the way Whitlam's achievement, achievements were built on a functioning party system that stood in contrast to the hollowed out version that now existed in Australia, one of manufactured black and white choices in modern elections. Um, and he argued that unless something could be done to renew that system, you would never have enough and another Gough Whitlam, that the kind of bold leadership he'd shown really required a kind of sustaining public conversation that uh, would no longer be possible. I guess mm. this comes back to your other theme uh, of the Whitlam Institute about yep. democracy. In the never-ending culture wars um, uh, that rage in Australia's op-ed pages, there was uh, plenty uh, at the time of Gough Whitlam's funeral. I won't go into these in great detail, but Andrew Bolt attacked the ABC for its lavish and lov loving coverage of the memorial service. It resembled the state-ordered mourning of a socialist dictator, he said. Can you imagine the ABC broadcasting night after night of loving shows dedicated to past Liberal Prime Ministers? To which the answer may well be no. Um, I don't know. Uh, Jared Henderson observed, the dismissal ensured Whitlam's status as a living legend destined to become a deceased legend. That's why Whitlam's excesses were all but eviscerated this week. My particular favourite, though, is Miranda Devine. Um, you know, the rancour and absence of proportion here. She claimed Whitlam personified the vicious ideological schism in Australia. So his send-off was suitably marked by squabbles and uncouth partisanship. She complained about the booing of Liberal Prime Ministers, which was pure bogan panto, she said. Pure. And uh, while she conceded that Whitlam would not, would not have behaved as gracelessly, um, his reckless dismantling of the moral capital of his forebears spawned such incivility. And she devoted much of her article, the rest of her article, to attacking Noel Pearson. Others had heard one of the great speeches in modern Australia. Um, she heard fakery and damaging illogic of the Australian left. And, and on it goes. I won't persist. Let me finish. Historians um, such as uh, John Hurst and Judith Brett have shown that Australians did not, or have not, usually found their heroes among politicians, uh, nor their legends in political history. Um, Australians have favoured Ned Kelly over Alfred Deakin, uh, Gallipoli, the Western Front, John Monash over Tenterfield, Federation and Henry Parks. Um, evokes the lack of interest aroused by the centenary of Federation, the sheer dagginess of the procession called Journey of a Nation. Uh, in Sydney on the 1st of January 2001. The centenary of Federation, she reported, uh, had been a fizzer. Yet there's surely one large and honourable exception to the rule that Australians look everywhere but in politics for what matters deeply to them, and that's, I think, Gough Whitlam. 
Now, until 2014, that might have been explained in terms of the dismissal, you know, as, as someone who was cut down his prime, like, I don't know, Ned Kelly, Liz, Liz Darcy, that kind of, you know, even the Gallipoli um, uh, failure of that campaign, you know, so you could place it in that kind of circumstance. And Whitlam feared as much that he would be recalled only for the 11th of November, primarily for the 11th of ne November, as King Charles I was for losing his head. But the events of October and November 2014 demonstrated that this fear was unfounded. In Paul Kelly's words, that Whitlam in death had conquered his political martyrdom. Um, but it also disclosed something, disclosed something significant about modern Australia. In an age of scepticism about politics, uh, declining trust, there was a recognition here that government mattered, a yearning for a politics that was bold, idealistic and grand. Whitlam's death occurred a few months after the Abbott government delivered um, a, a savagely unjust budget, one that brazenly, brazenly broke election promises delivered with hand on heart just a few months before. But for many Australians in the age of Abbott, it was the Whitlam era that had seen the full realisation of the nation's potential. Or as John Faulkner in the last of our slides, um, who delivered one of the eulogies at the service, put it eloquently, he showed us what we at our best can aspire to be. Thank you. Thank you, Frank.